Hi, everybody. I am excited for a double feature this month for all new and returning faces. Welcome. Thank you for prying yourself away from the beautiful weather coming inside for this great educational opportunity. Uh, if you've been with us for previous meetings, we typically have a few things that we do in the beginning, um, and then we have a guest speaker and then some things at the end. But because we have two meetings this month, um, we're going to do things just a little bit differently. We're going to have a very brief intro, and then um, our guest speaker will get started. And then at the end, we'll have uh, an abbreviated version of our upcoming events. And um, then afterwards, we're going to have a short board meeting. So the board meeting is open to the public, but you do not need to stay in any way. Um, we just have a few things to discuss. So um, this is the first of our two April meetings for our Wild Ones chapter. And we have uh, lots of in-person events planned for this month and going into next month. So stay tuned for those upcoming events at the end. I'm going to give everybody just another minute to file in and then we'll get started with the couple things that we need to do before we can introduce our guest speaker. While we get started, I'll introduce all of us. Um, some of the board couldn't be here for the beginning of the meeting, but they will join us later. Uh, I'm Jesse, president of the Southeastern PA chapter of Wild Ones. Um, we're looking for a vice president if you're interested. Susan will be on with us later. I think Denise is joining us later. I saw Judy here and uh, Marilyn here. Rick's going to join us later, I think. We're looking for a homeowner advising committee if you want to help us help people in their properties uh, make great choices with native plants, reach out. And a community project chair would be great to get things done in bigger spaces. Um, just some bonus blooms that are happening right now. Um, all of our spring ephemerals are starting to pop up. It seems like you can go out in the morning and then go out in the evening and see different things emerging just in those few short hours. So it's a really busy and fun time. Uh, if you look at the picture in the top middle, I was really excited to catch this stage because I feel like usually, if you know the plant, it's um, Packer or Aria or Golden Ground Soul um, or Golden Ragwort, some people call it also. But you see these tight purple blooms and you think, oh, you're going to have a purple flower. And then poof, there's this beautiful little yellow daisy flower. But it seems like you don't see the transition very often. So today was the transition. I'm guessing probably maybe tomorrow those yellow flowers are going to be out there. But I just thought it was a, a fun little peek into what's going to be in the next couple of days. And then barren strawberry has started. Um, it's the flocks show right now. A couple of different species of flocks are blooming. And um, our native Paxandra is starting to bloom. That's the bottom left, second from the left. And I wish I had tagged this Carex that is in bloom here, bottom left, um, but I don't remember which one it is. It does have interesting spiky little blooms though. So just some fun stuff that's happening at my place. Get out there and look, um, it's endlessly fascinating. Hey, Jesse, what's the top left? Uh, so top left is a mix of things. There is some trillium in there. There's white avens in there, which um, volunteered for me and is volunteering prolifically, um, but has a really interesting uh, foliage stays evergreen. It's basil rosette. Um, the first year is different than the second year. It's, it's a lovely little plant that's taking up lots of empty space for me. Um, there's Dutchman's breeches in there. 
um, violets are in there just to the left of the picture. I thought I got it in, but I didn't. There's um, some water leaf and some other native pacara. The little trunk that you see is a uh, Pennsylvania maple or a moose wood. Um, it has fascinating little buds on it right now. So that's that new bed that I put in last year. And this is what's coming up just this spring. So it's it's very exciting. Okay. We had some stuff coming up like that right next to the barn. And I thought, I guess I'm going to have to get out something to actually identify it because I thought some of it was invasive things, judging by where it is. Or it might just look like that and be invasive. Yeah, there are lots of things that look kind of similar this time of year. Um, okay. Yeah, yep. For right. sure. Thanks. Okay, so on to our main event. And I want to check this chat real quick in case. Oh, okay. I, I did. Oh, top right is barren strawberry. Um, And you can tell the difference now between the barren strawberry and the um what people call wild strawberry or the non-native strawberry because barren strawberry flowers are yellow and the more prolific um, non-native strawberry uh, has white flowers and they're not blooming yet. So excited for Mike Slater to talk with us twice this month. Um, back to back, we'll be here tonight and we will be here next Wednesday. Mike. And I met um, because my husband posted something on Nextdoor about native plants and um, welcoming people to our property if they wanted to come take a tour and see and learn about native plants and stuff. And I don't know how the conversation between Justin and, and Mike kind of started, but he ended up here. Um, we had a great day. He taught me way more than I could show him, but um, it was a lot of fun walking around and, and talking native plants. So uh, he volunteered to teach us some stuff and I definitely took him up on that. Mike has a lifelong interest in natural history. He received a BS in biology from Allegheny College in Meadville, PA in 1976 and went to work in the field of environmental education. Since then, he has also worked in environmental testing laboratories as a horticulturist and as a lab assistant setting up science labs at Reading Area Community College. Mike's interest in both native plants and insects has led him to focus on pollination, especially with regard to butterflies and bees. Since digital photography became easy, Mike has been taking thousands of pictures of plants and insects, and especially insects visiting native flowers. These pictures are used in talks like this and were a big part of the newspaper column about nature that ran from September 2012 until April 2020 in the Reading Eagles Berks County section called Outside about the natural world, mainly in Berks, Lancaster, and surrounding counties. Mike's interest in pollinators also resulted in a multi-year project collecting, identifying, and documenting native and introduced bees at Fort Indian Town Gap in Lebanon and Dauphin counties and identifying bees for the PA Natural Heritage Program. Mike is active and is past president of the Entomological Society of Pennsylvania, the Muhlenberg Botany Society of Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and the Bard Ornithological Club in Berks County, PA. Mike and his wife, Jan, have helped with seed collecting and meadow planting in several public places, including Middle Creek, BMA, Union Meadows um, Rec Area near Birdsboro, PA, and Green Hills Preserve in Southern Berks County. Mike is also very involved with the PA Ma Master Naturalist Program as a teacher in the subjects of entomology, ornithology, botany, and geology, and as one of the class coordinators for the Berks County classes. Jan and Mike's one-acre property is well-stocked with native meadow, especially tall ones, and woodland flowers. A property appraiser once described their landscaping with a single word, atypical, but the birds and insects love it. Um, Mike, as you can attest, I also fall into that atypical category. So it's wonderful. I am going to stop sharing so that Mike can take over and um, start our presentation for tonight. And you should be good to go.
you're just muted, Mike, but besides that, it looks great. Just muted, Mike. All right, now I'm on mute. I don't know how I got muted. I'm not actually with the Perky Omen Watershed Association. Ryan Belts, the director, is a good friend of ours, and I've helped them with consulting. But I've and I've done master naturalist training when they held the programs there. But that right was, now I'm, I'm an sorry. independent person. I'm sorry, Mike. That was my fault. It was a cut and paste slide that I forgot to cut. Okay, no problem. I just don't want to have Ryan blamed for me. Okay, so um, I think we can get going. And if anyone has any questions, you can put them in the chat or we're probably a small enough group that we can just chime in. Um, we set this up for two nights, so we should have time to answer some questions if there's questions. Or I may just say we'll be getting to that next week or later tonight or something like that. So as, as Jesse said, I'm interested in insects and plants. So pollination is one of the major interactions between plants and animals. And if my screen would advance, there we go. So pollination, a lot of people think of relations between plants and animals as insects eating plants and other animals, deer eating plants, which is certainly true. But in, or is this, why is this? Okay, let me know if you're not seeing it. So, or is pollination plants cooperating with animals, which is what a lot of people think that pollination is, um, is that they're getting along fine. There's mutual beneficial. Um, things between them, but there's not necessarily getting along as much as using each other. And that's what we're going to be talking about because there's conflicting priorities between them. And the, I'm going to name things if I don't have them on here. The top right flower is uh, Erythronium americanum, um, trout lily, and the butterfly on the left is a hoary edge skipper on a black raspberry, native black raspberry flower. Okay, we like to grow flowers, but flowers aren't just for pretty. They have a whole purpose for the plant. We've adapted them. This is not native. This is a Mexican sunflower, Tithonia, but we like them. But they're a source of food for many bees, butterflies, Flies, like surfed flies, the flower flies, uh, beetles, some, uh, many flower beetles get resources from the flowers. So I want to show you, can you see my mouse well here? I may have to, um, I think I can go to, I forgot to check this. Yes, we can see your cursor. Okay, I'm, I'm not. There should be a way to turn it into a red dot, but it's not showing up tonight. Anyway, so basic biology of a flower, we've got petals and seed petals are visible here on this Jeffersonia, the white petals. Sepals would be the green parts behind the flowers that encase the bud. We have the um, stamens, which are vertical and either have pollen, in this case, exit slits in the sides or at the tip would be the anthers where the pollen comes out. We have this um, pistil in the center, which is the base has the, contains the ovary where the eggs are and the seeds will develop. And the top here, the white crystalline looking bit is the stigma. That's where the pollen has to fall or, or touch and stick and grow to develop into the flower. So we're going to be talking about those parts a lot, the sexy bits, as the Brits would say, of flowers, because that has a whole lot to do with this. So what does a plant want? They want to move pollen from an anther on one flower onto the stigma of a different flower of the same species, preferably a different individual or plant resulting in fertilization. So 
so I can see right. how to do that. So my advance is working weird. Let, we'll see how it goes. So we're going to look at milkweed here for a second, common milkweed. We'll get into the details of the pollination mechanisms of milkweed next week. But milkweed is using this um, brown-belted bumblebee here to take pollen from one flower to another. And the goal, what they really want, is a seed pod containing seeds with different heritage for genetic variation that can be distributed, in this case, on the wind. So plants, this is the only stage they normally do a lot of moving on is, is the seeds. They can't move around to pollinate, so they've got to do it another way. So the old fashioned way, the way plants used to do it only before animals got involved was on the wind. So here's a close up of big blue stem grass with its anthers hanging down. So each of the little tubes here shakes in just the tiniest amount of wind and the pollen falls out and floats on the wind and it has to end up on the pistil or the stigma of another flower. Can anyone see the female stigmas on this big blue stem? Take a look. They're sticking out. They're these little purplish things with fuzz on them coming out the sides. Those are the female stigmas where the pollen has to land. They're like brushes to sieve the pollen out of the air. Another wind pollinated plant you may be very familiar with is ragweed. This is giant ragweed, Ambrosia trifida, which is native. Uh, the flowers hang upside down. It's actually in the aster sunflower family. And when the pollen open or the flower opens, the pollen can fall out if on a dry day and get carried on the wind to land on another flower. But we're going to look at a non-native here because this is the for wind pollination. This is one that happened to be in bloom when I first started getting pictures together for this talk. And I like the way they turned out. So the flower is has no petals, noticeable petals, long stamens with the anthers coming out. The pistils will be up on the top later. And the anthers look like this when you lay them down on a ruler. So this is a millimeter ruler. So the anthers are less than a millimeter and a half long. And there's slits in the side and the pollen can find, fall out and it's little white round dust-like particles that just fall in a really light and can float on the wind. And you can see they're very small and they're able to travel. They don't, they aren't sticky. So in a recent development, since plants started flowering, some plants get animals to do this job of moving pollen around. And they do it because animals are mobile. If they recruit them, they can carry the pollen from one plant to another for genetic diversity. And in animals, it can be insects, it can be um, butter, like butterflies and bees, it can be even bats, it can be mammals like mice. And one of my favorite plants from South Africa has gerbils as a pollinator that carry the pollen around. So it can be a lot of different kinds of animals. So, but how do they get the animals to do this job? Well, they they give a reward. They offer a reward for the service. But the plant doesn't want to raise its resources and give too much of a reward. So they have, there's a competition here. They want to give enough to get the plant animal to come, but not too much. And they want fidelity for efficiency. The ideal pollinator for a plant would be one that would only visit plants of that same species and never go to any other kind of plant. And also not eat all the pollen. There's one kind of bee, which I'm gonna mention later, which is known one of our little bees to eat all the pollen. It's, it's so good at collecting it and eating it and feeding it to its babies that it doesn't do any pollination service at all for the plant. So many different plants have strategies to encourage this fidelity and increase the pollen transfer efficiency. And they can do it by displaying specific attractants. It can be a color like the pink of roses or the yellow of a 
buttercup. It can be scents. It can be how include guidelines and patterns to direct the insect or the animal for pollination. Some have exclusionary the mouth of the flower is closed. So not every pollinator can get in, only ones that know how to do it. And some do it by pollen placement. The anthers may put the pollen on top of some an animal's head and some other plants might put it on their chest. So that'll give you a way of not getting the pollen mixed up. And all together, these things are called a pollination syndrome. And we'll talk a little bit about those in a few minutes. So what do animals get out of this? What do they want? They want nectar and or pollen. It can be both or just one or the other for food. So here this bumblebee is a female. She's collecting pollen in the pollen baskets on her leg. You can see the nice big orange pollen mixture of pollen and nectar that she's packed in there to carry it back to her nest. She's on a mountain mint flower here and she's so she's mainly collecting nectar right now because she doesn't isn't getting orange pollen off this. She's already gotten orange pollen off other flowers, probably a um, St. John's wort. So what do the insects want? They want um, a reliable source. They need enough food to meet their needs for the lifetime. Um, Bees and butterflies have long lives and some have short lives. There's some butterflies and bees that may only take two weeks for their entire adult life. But there's others like bumblebees here that have several months, so they would need multiple species. And the pollen contains protein and it contains lipids or fats and oils. And that's food that need, their babies need to grow up big and strong. Nectar is sugar that supplies energy for both the young and the adults. And many bees with longer lives then have to rely on more than one species of plant. Some bees um, are very specific and require one species of plant and have a very short adult life. Maybe only, like I said, one week or a couple weeks to a month um, that they bloom and they may be very much specialists. Like there's some bees we could talk about that specialize in collecting um, pollen from just one kind of flower, as I said. Okay, so here's just a few examples of bumblebees on different flowers throughout the summer from our yard. So on a mountain mint, a brown belted bumblebee on white clover, Common Eastern bumblebee on purple dead nettle, even though it's an invasive non-native species. Bumblebees and other bees do like it. If they have a long enough tongue. Showy goldenrod with a common Eastern bumblebee. Common milkweed and butterfly weed. Butterfly milkweed. A Monarda fistulosa. Purple Monarda with Bumblebee, uh, bumblebee, common eastern bumblebee on one of our native wild sunflowers, a helianthus species, a two spotted bumblebee visiting beard tongue, a brown belted bumblebee visiting wild blue flag, iris versicolor, and I could go on and on. So Let's talk, look a little bit at a flower that's pollinated by animals and its pollen. So here's um, native honeysuckle, trumpet honeysuckle, Lanicera sempervirens, which is pollinated by hummingbirds. If we look close at the flower here, we can see we've got the long tubular corolla, which flares out with no real perch for an insect to land has to be an, an animal like a hummingbird that can hover. There's five anthers or stamens that come out with these curved flat anthers at the end that the pollen is covering, as you can see. And down here in the center is the round end of the pistil with the stigma where the pollen has to be received. So you can see if a hummingbird comes in here and has pollen on its face, 
when it comes into the next flower, it can get some of the pollen onto the onto the stigma of the next flower. So if we look at this guy, why is it? Okay, so this is the pollen up close the same way under the microscope. Um, you can see it's a little bigger and it's sort of clumpy, it's sticking together. And I put them side by side here for comparison. So you can see quite a difference in the size of the pollen and how they're um, arranged. This heavy sticky pollen, which many flowers like say goldenrods have, can't float on the air and get in someone's nose and cause hay fever or allergies. It has to be something small and light, non-sticky that can do it. The whole point of the plant is wanting to have the pollen stick to something else, which in the, is a bee or a butterfly or some other insect. So the next thing the plant does, once it has this pollen ready to go, it has to tell the pollinator how to find it. Um, a lot of animals do it because the flowers give them really great signals, guidelines, targets, like the blue-eyed grass here has just a great target in the center. One of my favorites in bloom right now are bluets, Houstonia cerulea, have a nice target in the center to direct the insect that's arriving. Some are, are a little more subtle, like wild geranium, but if you look closely, it does have distinct guidelines. These are the uh, anthers up here, which have bluish pollen or white, bluish white pollen. And here's a little bee on that, visiting it. One of our, probably a Lazio glass and one of the sweat bees. The one thing I want to notice, this is a good place to point out, bees tend to be very hairy insects. And that's the reason they got into the pollination game several hundred million years ago. They're pre-adapted for carrying pollen because all bees at least have a few branched hairs somewhere on their body. Wasps, um, what we consider wasps now, all have simple hairs. They don't have branched hairs. And bees are basically a group of insects that went vegan. They only eat pollen and nectar. They've given up eating any meat or attacking, eating other animals at all in their life cycle. Now, a few other wasps have gone on. Bees are actually really just a specialized group of wasps. They're not completely separate from wasps. They they have a lot of sort of close relatives in the wasp family. So, But bees, because of these hairs, and the hairs also tend to have a, a static charge that helps them hold on to pollen too. So that's one reason why bees are really good at pollination. So for the pollination syndrome, this is my favorite picture of guidelines for a bee. I mean, it, this is like landing at an airport for an airplane. It's just really showing the insect where to go here and land in the iris. And we can't see any of the stamens or the pistil in here, but they're up, the pistil's up under this arch um, flag of the iris and the, uh, the nectar then will be down here in the center. So the bee has to crawl under it. So the bee is going to get pollen on its back when it goes in. And then again, when it visits the next flower. But not everything that we see is the same as insects. They don't see the same way. Their eyes don't work quite the same. They see a lot more ultraviolet than we do. And so on this evening primrose, this is what it looks like to us. And if you look at it a little more closely, you can see there's a faint dark pattern in there, but we don't really see very much. And the other thing I want you to notice on this evening primrose is the anthers, like over here, the pollen thread, the pollens are on sticky threads called viscid threads. And it really takes a special bee to be able to handle pollen stuck in all this sticky webbing. So not every bee likes evening primroses. And the other thing is the stigma at the end of the pistil here is like a cross. It's got four arms and it's pretty big. So anything else in the evening primrose family has a similar stigma to that at the end of the pistil. 
but it's not very conspicuous here. But what I did was I took one of my ultraviolet flashlights and I shown it on the same evening primrose flower. This is exactly the same as the last one, exactly the same flower. And you can see now we can see a little bit of the pattern. There's a dark center here as a target. Um, the stigma is still in, in, sort of inconspicuous. But then I took this picture with a different flashlight that's a narrow wavelength ultraviolet flashlight. And the stigma is this nice black target. And we've got a nice pattern in here. I haven't invested in an ultraviolet photography camera. That takes a, buying a special camera and getting it modified by someone. And so this is what I get. But this is just to show that what we see, you know, something might be dark that looks like an insect might be dark or it might be bright when it looks dark to us, depends on the, the pattern, but insects are seeing a different thing and then bats would be seeing something different altogether or they could be using smells. So many flowers attract a lot of different kinds of pollinators. They're very generalists. Um, and this was, whether this was a syndrome or not, apparently was controversial, but I think people, botanists or pollination ecologists have decided that it's a syndrome if you're a generalist, <clears throat> excuse me. So this is wide, flat open. Most any insect like this leather wing beetle can visit it, get pollen and nectar. So they have to produce a lot of extra nectar and pollen because anything can visit it, can go to all different kinds of plants. And it isn't very selective. Um, you can have big groups of flowers like that. So anything in the parsley family, a lot of things in the parsley family have big flat topped flowers. This is a native one. I could have put in a picture of Queen Anne's lace or dill or all kinds of things. Good landing platform, but I like cow parsnip, even though it's reported to be cause of photodermatitis, like its invasive cousin, the giant hogweed. Although I have not found any personal stories from anyone saying they know or got photodermatitis from it here in the eastern U.S. In western U.S. and in Canada or in Alaska, yes, but the eastern U.S. no. And this is quite a nice plant. I find like it in my native garden. It's about five feet tall. It's very very spectacular. But a lot of insects like it. So, all right. So here's just a few, um, a skipper butterfly on it. A bee, one of the mining bees, an andrina. A similar shaped flower with a flat top is elderberry, Sambucus canadensis. And whether it's wind pollinate or insect pollinate, maybe in between. And you can see this longhorn beetle here. She's really covered herself with pollen as she's crawling around on this elderberry from them. Um, it may be taking advantage of both, but so it's a big open platform that anything can be landing on. Some animals or some plants have gone to taking their flowers and taking instead of flat, it just opens round. So there's basically no direction an insect can come and not pollinate this plant. It's very easy to get to. Um, so and it's, just, again, a generalist visited by lots of things like butterflies, this gray hair streak. Um, this is one of my favorites. We'll see if this video works. So blue wing wasps, um, scolia, this is um, scolia dubia. You can see it doesn't take any special behavior here to pollinate. Just basically crawl around and stick your head in one, one of the flowers in the head after another. Not hard. So has anyone seen these guys in their yards? They're good to have because their larvae feed on beetle grubs in the lawn, especially Japanese beetles and June beetles. The female goes into the ground and finds a, a grub and lays an egg on it. And that's 
great if you want to control Japanese beetles, but you won't have these wasps if you don't have the shallow flowers that they can get nectar out of. They can't get nectar out of deep flowers. So things like mountain mints, um, the Eryngium yuccafolium here, the rattlesnake master, which isn't quite native to Pennsylvania. It makes it far east as Ohio. Um, but they're a great thing to have around if you want to control Japanese beetle grubs. So you need to tell people if they have Japanese beetles, they shouldn't buy those beetle traps. They should plant mountain mint and rattlesnake master. So the adult blue winged wasps have something to feed on and then they'll lay their eggs on the other guys. So another round thing that's one of my favorite plants, another round flower that's hard to get to is button bush. Cephalanthus. Um, Occidentalis, all kinds of insects. And this is the plant that Doug Tallamy recommends as sort of a substitute for butterfly bush if people want. It doesn't have the long blooming season, but it certainly is attractive to a lot of plants. So here are a lot of insects. Um, here's a few. This butterflies don't really believe in gravity. They don't care which way's up and down while they're nectaring. Um, and bees, um, here's a skipper, a little glassy wing. Um, we're going to talk about their mouth parts again in a few minutes. In my yard, my button bush was the first time, this was my life juniper hair streak, our only green butterfly here in Pennsylvania. I was just so excited when I had this guy on the butterfly bush along in the rain garden along our driveway. Another insect you may see is this Alanthus webworm moth. This is a native moth, native actually originally to Florida, and it feeds on down there. Its caterpillars in a little web feed on a relative of Tree of Heaven or Alanthus altissima. But they once Alanthus was introduced here, those moths spread north from Florida and probably help a little bit to control Lanthus. Not enough, but it's a beautiful little moth. Doesn't even look like a moth. I think it looks like a little bit of, bit of coral and pearl jewelry or something. But if you don't have the, in, uh, the plants for nectar for the adult, you won't get the caterpillars eating any Lanthus leaves at all. So this you'll see this fairly commonly if you have the right kind of flowers in your yard. Bumblebees like button bush. And you can see there's literally no direction that an insect could approach this plant and not pollinate it. Just has to land on the thing. The other, another option is to go long, to take that same thing instead of flat, taking a flat and making a sphere, you can stretch it out into a long spike that either blooms from the bottom up to give you a long bloom time or from the top down in a few cases. Most flowers are from the bottom up. So the old flowers are at the bottom and the young flowers or buds are toward the top. Culver's root's one of my favorite. It comes in white like this or a lavender pink. It's pretty purple stamens. And anthers, um, bumblebees like it. And a lot of other insects, similar shape, black cohosh. Buds down below, or open flowers below, buds up above. Um, even chestnuts, this is a hybrid American chestnut, but they have a similar bottle shape and they're visited by all kinds of insects. A rare native devil's bit, Camelarium luteum and the, what was considered the lily family, um, has a similar, but even frillier shaped flower. And they can be in other colors, this is, um, Indigo bush, wild indigo bush, Morpha fruticosa. Uh, it's purple. This is in the pea family, but it is the same thing. This is an adventive species that's spreading from the southern U.S. It's become fairly common up the Susquehanna River in recent decades. I don't know if it's coming into the Philly area up the Delaware or not yet. Next. So in pollination ecology, and if you're dealing with plants, 
size matters. You, you have to have a matching insect to the flower to get pollination. So here in the Eastern prickly pear cactus, you can see this queen um, brown belted bumblebee. She's gotten in there, wallowed around. She's gotten herself covered with pollen from all these many, many stamens down here with the anthers at the end. This is the pistil in the center, this uh, little fist-like cluster of the flower. So in cactuses, and this is the only cactus native to Pennsylvania, and it is native to Pennsylvania, um, when they open the first day, the anthers produce pollen, and then they close for the night. And the next day when the flower opens, pistil will spread and it'll look yellow or green octopus shape, and it'll be receptive to pollen that second day. So cactus flowers only last two days in general, um, at least all the North American ones, as far as I know, are that way that last two days. So any plant that's like this, that produces pollen the first day, and then the second day is receptive, is called a protandrous, which means the anthers produce pollen first. Um, the opposite situation where a plant's receptive the first day and then produces pollen later is um, gynecious and, I think that, no, that's not right. Anyway, that's a, a less common situation, but it could happen. And that's a way for the plant to present itself from cross-pollinating, to get outcrossing for genetic diversity. So this little solitary bee and another native eastern prickly pear here on the anthers, you see this is the pistil up here. Even if it comes back the second day or comes from another flower, there's no way it's going to do the job. It's just going to be basically eating some pollen and maybe it can get down and get some nectar. It's not going to be able to pollinate this plant. But some flowers are tight. So this is a flock species. This one happens to be in Oregon. And I was taking a picture of it when we were out there on vacation. And at first there was nothing. And then I saw this. And it was a little insect backing out a little lazia glossum, probably a bee backing out of the phlox flower. So small bees can actually get down in there and you can see the anthers sticking out of the flower. Why is it backing out? So this is what the flower would look like at first with just the, the anther sticking out and the, and the pistil down inside. So it really takes an insect crawling in. Moths and butterflies do sometimes visit these, but they're just going to stick a proboscis in. They're not really going to do a very good job of pollination. Don't ask me why this picture is here so many times. The mysteries of PowerPoint. So this is the bee leaving after getting her little nectar drink down inside. Um, we do have native phloxes. This is a, a less common one, wild sweet william or phlox, phlox maculata, which grows at Bullshaw Craig Preserve in Montgomery County, owned by Natural Lands Trust. Uh, it's a, a very fascinating native diabase meadow. It has a lot of rare plants, and this is one of them. Phlox maculata isn't, isn't very common in Pennsylvania, but all the phloxes have pretty much the same flower shape. And here's an insect's view of the door. So what do you think pollinates something like this? A Turk's cap lily, the native um, lily. It can't be a small insect because mm. here we've got our anthers, which aren't producing any pollen yet. Yeah. They're still tight. And here's the pistil at the end of, and the stigma at the end. So it has to be a large insect. Certainly has a lot of targets here for this okay. um, Lilium superbum. Now, if you look at the lily behind, you can see it's got the red pollen sticking out. It's, it's producing its pollen. So what do you think would pollinate that? What would be big enough? If you're familiar with it, that's a couple inch that gap. It's too big even for a bumblebee. Maybe a fox. A, a fox. Hummingbird. Hummingbirds may visit them, um, but they probably don't do a good job pollinating. Mm. And 
this like this little butterfly, this um, silver spotted skipper here is not big enough to do a pollination, but a bigger butterfly like swallowtails are long enough. So you, so you can see this butterfly, her nectar, it or yeah, no, I think that's a male. Looks like it's blue, not greenish there on the upper hind wing. Um, her proboscis is up here getting nectar. The nectaries are actually up at the back of the petals of the tepals, but her tails and her hind wings are long enough. And tiger swallow tails are the same way. It's even easier to see the proboscis here. See, um, I don't know if that's a male or female. The butterfly's nectaring. It's getting nectar from the back of the petals, right between the petals up there but the body is long enough to be getting pollen over it. But over here, we've got some little bees that aren't gonna be doing a very good job of pollinating, but they're getting collecting some pollen as well. So they're doing a little freeloading too. And that is a species that's um, variable in color. It can be bright reddish orange to pale orange. These pictures were all taken over um, either at Middle Creek Wildlife Management Area in Lancaster, Lebanon County, or at the game lands just a few miles to the west of there. So one of the things I mentioned is the problems that plants have of freeloaders or things that get things mixed up, that you have things. A lot of one solution some plants have come up is timing. If you're the only thing in bloom at a given period of time, if an insect visits it, it doesn't have anywhere else to go. The next stop is bound to be another hepatica in this case. The hepatica blooms now, very early. I've, I've even seen it blooming in late March. Um, but out in our, in some of our woods, we'll find hepaticas. This is my favorite color forms to find these blue purple ones. They can be white or pink as well. But in this case, out in the woods, when this is in bloom, there's not much else for an insect to visit. So the chance of the next stop being a hepatica flower is pretty good. So that's one way to do it. And I just had to show you the whole flowers without those words in the way, because it's just beautiful, one of my favorites. Another plant that's in bloom right now and is doing almost the same thing are bloodroot. So, and besides the fact that they have the timing thing that there's not much else in bloom, Bloodroot also is a natural little solar heater, a little solar oven and collector that reflects the sunlight onto a visiting exit, insect to give it a little extra boost so it can fly onto the next flower on a cold day, even if it's sunny. And these flowers tend to only open when it's sunny. They stay closed or close up at night or when it's cool. So both the hepatica and the bloodroot do this. So they're, they're um, not getting found by other things that might eat them, say a deer, or they're also not getting rain splashing the pollen out. They're protecting themselves by that, by closing up at night. So how many people here have bloodroot as their favorite spring flower? Well, except for trilliums, maybe trilliums. Anyway, the other end of the season, at Thanksgiving, we have this, witch hazel. Pretty much a, a nice shrub, has these four greeny little petals on the flowers. And it's visited by some moths that fly in cool seasons and it's pollinated. And it takes a year for the seed pod to develop. So this is this year's flower and that's last year's seed pods. And witch hazel is amazing for a bunch of reasons. One of them is the seeds, seed pod is woody and hard. And as it ages, when it gets to be fully ripe, again, following fall and dries out, it splits up, builds up pressure as it pulls apart a little and then snaps open and it launches the seed. And that kind of seed dispersal, which can be many feet or tens of feet, is called ballistic seed dispersal. And we have a bunch of plants to do that. Jewel weed is another common one that does it by ballistic seed dispersal. And violets do it 
Um, but then violets add another thing. They have a little tasty morsel attached to their seeds. The ants pick up and carry them even farther. So they do a two-stage launch. But one thing you might wonder is the biology. How does a seed, a flower get pollinated when it's cold, say at beginning of December or the end of November, and then develop? Well, actually, what happens in a flower when it's pollinated is pollen grain lands on the flower, gets stuck to the stigma, and there's chemical signals and nutrients provided. It grows what's called a pollen tube all the way down into the ovary. And once that tube's developed, then two sperm swim down the tube and fertilize the flower. It's a two-stage fertilization or double fertilization, it's called. And one will form the seed, the embryo, and the other sperm will fertilize part, another part of the flower, some remnant um, chromosome bodies that form the endosperm or the food for the flower. So that would be like the surrounding food of the ovary that provides the food for the embryo. So if you would be eating a bean, the embryo is the little part in the center that will grow to the plant. And the bean part that we eat, that's food for the plant. So that most plants need that double fertilization. They need the two sperm. And in the witch hazel, it takes all winter until the next spring for that tube to grow down. And then the fertilization occurs many months later in the spring after the pollination. I just find that amazing. It has to wait that long, but it does. Another timing event you can have are things that bloom a short period of time during the day. This is not native, hibiscus trionum flower of an hour. It's a, one of my favorite little weeds, though. It's not very, it only invades disturbed soils. But these gorgeous little hibiscus flowers open mid-afternoon for about an hour and then close up. So there's a lot of them open. So pollinators will find them, go between them, and then they close up and that event is done for the day. Uh, another plant that does the same thing is fame flower, Femoranthus teretifolius. This is a rare native found on serpentine barrens along the southern Chester County. Lancaster County and into formerly Delaware County. I don't know if there's still any serpentine barrens there or not, but it only opens again for a short time in the afternoon. And it's called fame flower because it's flowers are fleeting like fame. It stays open for just a little while and then it's over. It's a very nice little plant. It's a, a nice succulent with round leaves, native door serpentine barrens. And then we'll go back to the evening primroses, except they have a cousin called sundrops that bloom in the daytime. Evening primroses open in the evening and attract moths. These attract bees and butterflies during the day. And you can see the lines are a little more prominent for, for guidelines. The evening primroses, like I said, bloom in the evening. Um, a lot of, they close up during the night and then the opening in the second day. There's a number of moths that will overnight they'll use the flowers of hotel for protection. They'll stay in the closed flower for the night. And I don't know what the little beetle's doing down there on the bottom of the flower. Don't know what he's up to. One problem if you do this sort of advertising is you can attract unwanted visitors. So primrose moss, this is a primrose moth, a cute little pink and yellow moth, comes and she finds the open flower and lays her eggs on it. And then the, her caterpillars feed on the seeds of the moss. So there's you know problems with advertising as well as advantages. You, if you're advertising, you might not get the bird you want. Okay, pollen placement. Where do you put, if you're a plant, where do you put your pollen on the insect? This is one of my favorites. Um, the prim passion flowers. This is a rare Pennsylvania native, the yellow passion flower, but I don't recommend it. You plant it in your garden unless you really like it because it tends to spread. But you can see that the, the stamens 
are here with the yellow pollen on them. And I bumped the flower when I was taking the picture and knocked some pollen off onto the flower. This is a small passion flower. It's only like the size of a quarter or even a nickel, not too big. And then the pistils, there's three of them. They come off the top. They're these branch things that come down with the round end. So if a bumblebee comes in here to get nectar, it's gonna get pollen on its back. And when it gets to the next flower, it can rub some of it off. So this is pollen placement on the back of the head or on the back of the insect. And large passion flowers like the, the purple passion flower, which is a Southern native is also the same way. One of my favorite native plants you don't see bloom very often, um, false hellebore, ratumbiridae, really nice swamp plant, has these incredible green flowers with these, um, I don't have a close up, but of the, they put the pollen on the back of the, of the insect that's visiting to get nectar as well. So we're gonna, how are we? I've taken about 55 minutes. How much longer do you want me to go tonight, Jesse? We're good for at least another 15 minutes or so. Okay. So the next thing a lot of plants want to do, rather than provide their pollen and nectar to just any visitor, they want to be exclusive. They want to hide it. So this is not a native, but the um, snapdragons, and their cousin butter and eggs have you've all everyone's played with snapdragons and squeezed them so you can open the sides, right? Yes. Um, these do the same thing. Only an insect that knows how to pry it open can get in there and do it. So one example, this is a beautiful native plant from the Pine Barrens of New Jersey and further south along the coast of North Carolina, um, Autumn Gentian fully open, visited by butterflies. Uh, all the gentians around here in Pennsylvania, true gentians, not the fringe gentian, are closed gentians or bottle gentians. So the top of the flower never opens and the petals are pleated. So they can't be opened. It keeps out the rain, but it also keeps out insects that don't know what to do. And the insects that know how to get in are bumblebees. So here's a bumblebee going in to one of our native bottle gentians, pries it open, squeezes in, and plant provides a very high, rich nectar. It's a, I've, I've read reports that it was measured as high as 40% sugar in the nectar of bottle gentians. So the bee just pries it open and just climbs all the way into the flower and then gets its nectar reward. And in the meantime, gets pollen on it that it'll carry to the next flower. So we'll see if we have time to do the sunflower. So I'm not gonna get into how the aster family or sunflowers work, but they do provide pollen the first day on the inner flowers, and then pollen on the inner flowers when the outer flowers become receptive. So the whole flower is a composite or group of flowers so it's a floral head, it's not an individual flower. And the, what we call the petal, actually gray flowers, they're specialized flowers with a long edge. And there's a whole lot of them, they're very important, uh, visited by a lot of generalists. Um, not everyone does a good, good job of pollen, pollinating them, but they're very important, especially in the fall. Um, and I love taking pictures of butterflies on them. They're always scenic. Um, this is one of my favorites, the old field aster or called frost aster. So, sometimes called heath aster, I don't like that name because there's a Midwestern species that deserves the name better because its name is Symphiotrichum um, ericoides, which means heath-like. But Asters are visited by all our favorite butterflies and a lot of our bees. Um, goldenrods are in the family. Um, and if you look closely, you can see their miniature yellow aster flowers. Uh, this is my favorite, Solodego speciosa, the showy, showy goldenrod. And as far as I know, at least in Eastern Pennsylvania, maybe the whole state, it's now found only at that Fulshaw Craig Preserve I mentioned in Montgomery County. It's become very rare. All the 
showy goldenrod you buy it um if you buy seed from the nursery or something is midwestern it'll be from wisconsin or minnesota not an eastern very nice tall showy goldenrod goldenrods are very um, popular with beetles i like beetles um lots of butterflies the differences main differences between the goldenrod species seem to be how the individual flowers in each head are the commonest weedy goldenrods that form big patches and take over by underground rhizomes tend to have small individual flower they're not quite as popular in my experience but i think my favorite ones in the aster sunflower family or the thistles and our native thistles are in trouble because of introduced weevils that eat their seeds um, all our native thistles are biennial they have a, a rosette the first winter and then the second year they put up a spike that blooms they're abundant product producers of pollen Bees love them, butterflies love them, at least long-tongued butterflies love them. And they're just incredible. So this is the um, one of the green sweat bees as I had on the last sign. You can see she, and unlike the bumblebees, these most other bees, or a lot of other bees, carry pollen in brushes on their legs that that hold it and, and they don't mix it with nectar to make a mass, they do it. Um, this is one of the easiest bees to identify. It's the only, if it's a carrying pollen, it's a female. If it's green head and thorax and a striped abdomen, it's this species, the um, Agapis teman virus. It's the only one in Pennsylvania where the female has that color, green body, and striped abdomen and carries them. So, all right, little guys, lots of flower flies, surfids can be very good pollinators. Some of them are just sort of obviously too small to do a pollination job, um, but they'll still eat pollen. One of the reasons we like surfid flies, if we're a gardener or as part of the web of life is their larvae are very predaceous on aphids. So if you have a problem with aphids on a plant, you want to have flower flies around. And the way you get flower flies is by not spraying insecticide to kill them. Because eventually they'll show up. We used to have a lot of problems with aphids on our trumpet honeysuckle. But after a few years, the flower flies showed up and they start laying eggs and their larvae eat all the aphids. And we haven't had a problem since. So we'll look at one more skipper here on a thistle. So skippers are a group of butterflies that hold, tend to hold their wings up above their back instead of out flat. Proboscis, which is this long black thing coming down, it's the straw that they suck nectar up with. This is a Leonard skipper. The caterpillars eat um, blue stem grasses. And so this is basically only found on our serpentine barrens naturally now that down in Southern Chester and Lancaster County. And this is on swamp thistle, one of my favorite thistles. And you can see, if it goes to the next slide. So here's a flower that's, or flower head that's just opening the um, proboscis can get way down in there to get the nectar down. There's no way a short-tongued insect is going to get there. But this butterfly is not going to do a very good job of, of pollinating. It's so standoffish, it can be way out and not get any pollen on its legs or body and not do much of a job of pollination. And a different view. You can tell I like skippers. So here's a skipper that's sort of over equipped for the flower. I just had, I just love this picture because um, it's a cousin of the Leonard skipper called the long dash, but the proboscis is just ridiculously long for the depth of the flowers on that European oxide daisy. 
Beetles like to visit things like that, though. Flower beet, flower scarabs have really fuzzy bellies. So you can see it's all hairy underneath. And it, as it collects, as she collects nectar by walking around the flower, she's going to do a job pollinating it. And the bee flies, like I said, can be pretty good. So this is a bigger one or flower fly that's big enough to do some pollination job. Um, I've, I've read lately, there's a good book about them, field guide that gets to the genus level at least, that it says they're very good pollinators. So we'll see. I'm going to show you right now why butterflies aren't so great. So this is a little yellow, which is a small yellow butterfly that only shows up some summers here, not every summer. They spread from the south and it's nectaring in a tick seed sunflower, Biden's polylepis, near um, Birdsboro here in Berks County. And the tick seed sunflowers are ones that have moved from the Midwest as we've made roads and railroads to allowed them to spread east. So we see them along highways. So this little yellow landed on this flower. The little yellow is maybe the size of a nickel, not a big butterfly round. And he landed, this is the male, on this flower. And he started uncoiling his proboscis. Because he's going to get a drink of nectar. And you can see he's not going to touch the flower with anything but his proboscis and possibly his front legs that might get some pollen on. So he sticks his proboscis down in one of the flowers in the head here. And then he moved it to a different flower to the right. They moved it to one of those flowers over there. And then back to one of the closed flowers up here. And so on without doing any pollination. He didn't do the job at all. Um, and we'll finish up here with one that you're probably familiar with, the Leatris or blazing stars or gay feathers. They're in the aster family. Um, sort of like thistles, mini thistle flowers, if you look at them. But this spike is different from the others I talked about earlier. It blooms from the top down. Most of the others bloom from the bottom up. This one, the, the Leatris, bloomed from the top down. So here's um, the peck skipper nectaring into the, you know, getting nectar out of the flower. And here's one, it's it, the flower it's sitting on isn't even the one it's getting the nectar out of. It's, it's proboscis is so long. They're very long, long tongue, so to speak. So now we're gonna, I'm gonna finish up with this. So this is a wild type zinnia. So our butterflies, if they're migratory like monarchs, could be familiar with them because they're native to Mexico. But the ray flowers are the big flat petals and the discs, disc flowers are date big and provide nectar. This kind of zinnia can be good for, for pollinators to provide nectar. But what breeders have done is produce things like this. So you can see, even if there would be some nectar down in there, it's gonna be really hard for an insect to get to it. And so it's not gonna provide much benefit or color and Besides the fact that there might not be any nectar there, or it might be hard to get to, the whole goal of plant breeding is not to produce nectar plants or pollen producing plants for insects, it's to produce a show. They might or might not be good. So this is why plants like nativars, native cultivars of native plants might or might not be good for pollinators. That wasn't the goal of the breeder to try to get that. They were trying to get something that looked good or was disease resistant or was short, like chrysanthemum mounds, you know, something like that. They weren't trying to get something that may or may not be good. So cultivars may be good for pollinators or may not. And um, another group of plants that has the same type of strategy is the um, dogwoods. Cornus. They have a group of flowers surrounded by, in this case, instead of petals, there's their leafy bracts, their modified leaves that provide the attraction. So but I love the sunflower and aster family. This is one of my favorites, the pale leaf sunflower. But once you've attracted or provided a 
a likely place for an insect to come, the predators will usually find it too. So there's a disadvantage to insects to always going back to a predictable place. You might find like this crab spider here waiting for you, or it's a place where dragonflies might hang out to catch an unwary pollinator. So there's disadvantages for the insects too. They have to be wary. It's not all beneficial on either side. So there's driving competition to gather the pollen and nectar. And if you're a bee, you want to gather it as quickly and efficiently as possible. So like some of those little native bees I showed you, like the little stamens, they have relatively small families. Some of those might only produce a dozen offspring in their life. That's it. That's their one shot. So they have to be efficient to collect enough pollen and nectar to feed those babies. So they want short trips. They don't want to make hours long trips to get all the supplies they need. One of my favorite books I'm going to show a cover next time is called Bumblebee Economics. And the author of that found that in the blueberry fields of Maine, where he was studying bumblebees, the ideal trip length for a bumblebee that if it was a really good day with lots of pollen and nectar, they could make a, tr a round trip with a complete load of pollen and nectar and get back to the nest in a, about 10 minutes. So don't want to spend too much time. So I think I'm going to stop there. And we'll pick up next time. If anyone has any questions you want to talk about tonight, I'm happy to do that. Yeah, I have a quick question about your your photography is absolutely, absolutely. unbelievable. unbelievable. It's uh, <laughs> incredible. Thank you. What what rig do you use to uh, or what lens? What specifically lens? Do you use? Well, I've used different things. Most a lot of those were taken with a little point and shoot Nikon camera about ten or twelve years ago. Um, now I tend to use. I have a. Panasonic Z200, and I have a, a now an even longer lens, a Nikon P1000. They're bridge cameras. They don't have a separate lens. It's a built-in lens. Does it have I a macro? That, Is it a macro? Yeah, you can get you can get very close. Yes, it, yeah. it's very close focusing. the The thing, the most important thing you want in a camera is one that's not so big that you won't take it with you, or you right. won't bother carrying it. You want one that you can use, that you will always have with you, because you never know when you're going to find something. So I used to go out with my little point and shoot every afternoon in the summer and walk around our yard and just see what I could take pictures of. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, I guess that's it. I said everything next week i'll talk a little bit or talk a lot about some special adaptations special pollination things like one of my favorites milkweeds how do they do that that puzzled me for a long time well i finally had some good talks from researchers that are, and information Mike, I have okay. another quick question for you. When you uh, were talking about cultivars and specifically, do you know, are there ongoing studies now about um, pollen some people, what, 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 how much pollen and how good is the pollen they're getting out of cultivars? Is anybody actually studying that? Oh, I don't know if anyone's doing that. Some people from the University of Delaware related to Doug Talley, but not his group are doing um, pollination visits to cultivars and straight species down at um, Mount Cuba mm -hmm. Gardens in Delaware. Um, there, I don't know if anyone's doing pollen and nectar quality on cultivars. I haven't heard that. Uh, people are doing more um, just observational things. What cultivars do people visit? So right. for example, the cultivar of mountain mint, Pycnanthemum muticum, that's widely available to gardeners around here, is not the straight species muticum. 
it's either a hybrid or a selection. I think it may be a hybrid. The flower heads are much bigger than the wild type. That's interesting. That I can do that. <laughs> so, and that particular cultivar that's a great pass around plant or sale plant is very attractive to pollinators for, in, for um, nectar. It's very visited, more than the wild type. And so in some cases, the cultivar might be better or native R might be better. And in some cases, it might be worse. Um, the thing to look for as a generalization is the more different the native R is from a wild type, or if it's a hybrid, the less likely it's to be good for pollinators to visit. For example, the Lobelia hybrids between the blue Lobelia syphilitica and the red Lobelia cardinalis that come in purples and stuff, those are terrible. Nothing, no, hummingbirds don't know what to do with them. Bees don't know what to do with them. No one visits them. Another one are these um, orange echinaceas, the orange and red echinaceas and stuff. They're so hybridized, they don't seem to attract much in the way of pollinators. They're so different from the purple wild types. You know, the, the yellow ancestor that is from the south or somewhere that was used in that breeding may be fine, but the hybrids don't seem to attract much. Um, but I don't know of anyone doing pollen quality on, or nectar quality on hybrids or cultivars. Now there's people studying nectar and pollen nutrition, like I've read some good papers out of the entomology labs at Penn State about the quality of pollen nutrition, the, the right ratio of protein to lipids in the pollen for feeding a baby bee. And we'll get into that a little bit next week when I talk about wild Santa. That's awesome, Mike. Thank you so much. Does anybody have any other questions for Mike? Well, this is Janet. Uh, it's not a question. I just, thanks, Mike. That was really fun. You know, we all think about pollinators and flowers and just to think, yeah. to realize the to... amazing evolution they've done to to specialize or to make their lives work. It was great. And, and... and there's, as we'll see next week, there's, there's tension there because the goals of the insects and the goals of the plants are not the same. They want different things out of this relationship. Right. And really there can, there's, there can be thing. tension there. Yeah, yeah, thanks, it was great. All right, guys, I, for one, I'm very excited for next week's edition also. So stay tuned for even more drama in the bug and plant world. Okay, I'll see you all next week, seven o'clock. Good night. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. All right, guys. We are going to move on here to the rest of our meeting. We just have a few things, so it'll be shorter than the um, typical meetings that we have. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if Audrey is on. Yeah, I am. Awesome. Then I'm going to mute and let Audrey take over our tree of the month spice book. So Northern Spicebush, or Lindera benzoin, is native to the eastern half of the United States. It's one of the first plants to bloom in early spring, brightening up the landscape with its small yellow flowers. This makes it an excellent substitute for the non-native forsythia that blooms around the same time. Both male and female plants flower, but only females will produce the deep red shiny berries, or droops in late summer, persisting into fall. Each droop contains a single seed, which can be used for plant propagation. Spicebush berries can be used to flavor foods such as you might use allspice. Newly emerged tiny green berries are peppery and citrusy. By August or September, berries are red and full size and sweeter with hints of cinnamon or clove. You can use them fresh, pickle or ferment them, or dry them for longer storage. Leaves, twigs, and bark of the spice bush can be used to make tea and have many different medicinal uses. 
all parts of are free right when bruised. Fall leaf color is golden yellow. Spice, spice bush is typically found growing in the woodland understory in clonal colonies, but it's adaptable to many growing conditions from full sun to full shade and wet to dry soil. Optimal conditions are part sun in rich, moist soil. They are classified as a shrub that can grow quite large. I have many in my yard that are as tall as small trees. Wildlife value is good. Flowers are a good early source of food for pollinators. Spicebush hosts nine species of native caterpillars, including the spicebush swallowtail and the eastern tiger swallowtail. Fruits attract over 20 species of song and game birds, including migrating thrushes. Small mammals also eat the fruit. Spicebush are relatively easy to grow and fairly disease free. They make an excellent addition to your garden and to your food forest. Awesome, Audrey, thank you so much. And as soon as you just said the um, spice bush swallowtail, I remember <laughs> that I forgot to put in the cutest caterpillar you'll ever see. Um, so I'm sorry, I gypped everybody in the seeing those pictures, but I'll try and remember, slide them in next time. Um, it is a lot of fun to walk by a spice bush right now because even in my yard, because I got my different spice bushes from different um, nurseries who got their stock from different places. Some are blooming, some are like just swelling in buds, some are full bloom. So it's interesting to see, I bet you if you did genetic testing on them, the ones that are in full bloom are probably a little bit um, southern genetics like where you are Audrey which because yours are in full bloom mm -hmm. whereas the ones that are just swelling in buds and like starting to get ready to bloom are probably more northern uh, just because we're not you know it gets warmer more southern earlier so I think I actually that's, have uh, leaves starting to grow on mine now yeah so that's it it's neat to see and if you pay attention like to your individual plants kind of comparing them how I bet the genetics play out. Um, we have some great upcoming opportunities. Uh, very excited about this event. It will be our first time doing this as a chapter. We're going to have a native plant swap. So as you are getting in your gardens this spring and you're finding babies and maybe um, dividing some plants or moving things around a little bit, or maybe some of your plants have wandered away from the place that you intended them to be and now they're in your walking path or they're somewhere else, you can bring them to the plant swap and share with your fellow native plant enthusiasts and get some things that you've been looking for, swap for the things that you either don't have room for or are just relocating. The flip side to this same event, it'll be happening at the same time, same place, is we are doing an invasives trade-in. Do not bring your invasives, but pictures. If you've removed invasives from your property, bring pictures. You'll get a native plant plug to reward you for the hard work that you are doing on your property to get rid of invasives and make room for native plants. Tell your neighbors, um, everybody come out. We're hoping that we get lots and lots and lots of people. Um, it'd be great if we get more than the five people that are planning the event. So anything more than five is gonna make me really happy. Some other upcoming opportunities that we have. Um, lots of nurseries are opening. So Redbud is already open. Geno's is already open. Edge of the Woods is already open. Hungry Hook opens this Friday. That's where I will be. Um, the Schoolkill Center is open, though they've had online sales, I believe. Bowman's Hill is opening up next weekend. Stonely um, Buds and Suds is happening. It's a virtual native plant sale. It opens to members on the 15th and to the public on the 16th. And I know from the last few years experience um, that first day when members only can shop, things sell out. So um they have a really great variety of things that are hard to come by. So it's definitely worth it um, to support natural lands with your membership anyways, but also to get access to that members only shopping is, is fantastic. And then you select your time to go pick up 
your plants. And a lot of times at the pickup, they will have some additional plants that either didn't sell or weren't ready during this, the virtual part of the sale, but are now available. So you can um, pick up some additional things when you get your order. The garden shop at Jenkins is opening on the 21st, and we're going to have a Wild Ones of Southeastern PA kind of meet up there and walk around the um, property. I've never been there. I'm excited, but I hear that the shop is really great, and uh, we are going to be going to the Lancaster Wildflower Festival. More to come on that in a couple slides, and um, I recommend going to the the PA Native Plant Society Native Plant Festival. It's in a different location this year than it was last year. Last year's location was great. It was a lot of fun. I hope that it is warmer this year when you go. Um, I got a little bit of hypothermia last year, but it was well worth it. Lots of really great plants. And then the Hawk Mountain Native Plant Sale will be towards the end of May, another really great sale that um, if Mike is still on. I don't think he is, but he has something to do with that <laughs> sale. I think he grows some things for them. So that's exciting. Um, some other opportunities, if you're in the area, uh, the Lancaster Conservancy is doing a wildflower walk at Shanks Ferry. That's a great place to go and see spring ephemeral plants. Um, there are opportunities to clean up. These are not specific to wild ones. We are just sharing the opportunities here. Earth Day at Phoenixville at Reservoir Park. We will have a table there as a chapter. So if you're interested in either um, coming to the table and sharing your enthusiasm, you don't have to be an expert to table at events. You just have to share your passion, your enthusiasm, the resources that we have available. Um, and just get the word out there about how great these native plants are and what joy they bring to not only us, but to all of the critters of the world. Um, the Lancaster Native Plant and Wildlife Festival, we're going to kind of meet up there, um, whoever wants to go. And there are lots of master gardener plant sales that are happening, not only in Philly, but each county has their own plant sales. They're not all on that day, I don't believe. So check out your local, uh, your your county's master gardeners plant sale. They don't sell strictly natives, but uh, as the years go by, they are trying to add more and more natives to their sales. So this is what I was alluding to, the Lancaster Native Plant and Wildlife Festival. Uh, we're going to go up there. We're going to hang out. There are lots of vendors that sell some really unique plants. Um, they have a lot of partners that share the same kind of message that are up there with tabling events and opportunities to um, find out what their organization is all about. But we have gotten this great uh, opportunity. Mark, I think that you're the Mark that has emailed me, right? Um, that's on this meeting tonight. Yes. Yeah, great. So <laughs> go ahead. Mark reached out to me and said, hey, what do you think about this? Yeah, I thought uh, since I live so close, um, it's like 10 minutes down the road. I live in Lidditz. And uh, even if um, you don't want to come to the house to, to tour at my property, uh, visiting Lidditz itself is wonderful. Uh, it's, it's a neat little town. But anyway, after um, <clears throat> the uh, um, festival, I'll be here from one o'clock uh, through the afternoon. So you're all welcome to come for some refreshments and take a tour of my property. We have about uh, roughly about six acres, part woodland. Um, and we built our house about 30 years ago. And I thought, you know, I should get, well, <clears throat> I had done some studies at uh, Longwood's Gar Longwood Gardens and um, about more exotic plants, and I didn't know anything about natives. So it's a lot about what I did wrong initially and how I'm going about in the last year or so and trying to rectify a lot of my mistakes. So it's uh, a work in progress, to say the least. So you're all invited to come and stop by. That could be very enlightening, that work talking about the mistakes. I think that's, that's really critical. <laughs> it is. And, and I, I have some good, bad, and really ugly stuff to see. But, <laughs> so it's a little bit of everything. And, uh, I, you know, you could find, I think you would find it interesting. And I'm in the middle of a lot of projects. I'm working on a rain garden and a 
Woodland Edge Garden right now. As a matter of fact, uh, speaking of Hungry Hook, I just got an email while we were online here that my plants are ready to go up and pick pick those up for my Woodland Edge Garden I'm going to put in. So nice. Did you there. do one of her, her new kits? I did. Yeah. Plus, I got some uh, <clears throat> wild strawberry, the Fregaria virginiana, for mm -hmm. some beds that I did previously that I just I just don't want to weed anymore. <laughs> Yep. So, but that uh, I'd be interesting to know from from you all what do you think about that plant and its aggressiveness with other natives? Now I know it would do well around woodies and not affect the plants. Would would that overrun potentially other natives? Uh, well, Ben Vaught likes to say, put your aggressives with your aggressives so they can duke it out. Let your bullies figure it out. So I wouldn't put anything delicate in there like um but if you have some other uh like mandar monardas or other aggressive native plants that like the same setting um yeah, they can push up against out. each other yeah yep. I, I was i'm going to use it in areas where again where i don't want to weed like i'm going to put in a um a food garden so mostly trees and shrubs and i think that would be a good spot for it too yeah I haven't noticed that it's that aggressive. I mean, there are a lot, there are other plants that are more aggressive than that, yeah. but then mine are pretty new. So I might experience more aggression later. And I think it's also, it's a, it's a jumper. Like it's going to fill in those empty spots um, around plants. It's not going to just mass right. solid ground. So um, yeah. And one person can say one thing I can have an experience you can have it they'll be completely different because there's so many factors not just you know sun and soil and all of that but the genetics mm -hmm. of where the seeds came from that grew those plants and you know what else is growing in them how bad your worm population is like all sorts of things feed into each individual plant in its different community and how it's going right. to react <clears throat> Uh, if anybody's interested, I'm getting getting four flats of that. So I'll have if um, if I could either give some to Jesse if uh, she's going to stop by my house, I believe, for the plant exchange. If anybody's interested and wants to reach out and would be interested in a couple of those, I, I don't know the availability. I, apparently, it was t pretty tough getting them for a while. They are hard to get typically. So, you know, if anybody's interested, just let me know. Yeah, that's very generous. Thank you. Um, so I am excited to come. I'll be at Mark's house if anybody wants to hang out. Um, okay, let me make sure I'm on to the next thing. Oh, I just saw this in an email. I don't know if everybody here is on the Homegrown National Park um, mailing list. They also have a fairly strong Facebook presence, at least in my county. They've started up their own like um, Nature's Best Hope or, or Homegrown National Park for Chester County. So that's really fun. But they have done an adaptation um, of Doug's book for kids. And you can purchase that if you um, have little kids or have little kids in your families, or you volunteer with a preschool. Um, what a great thing, a great first introduction to this whole concept. Uh, so I was excited about that. I'll be purchasing that for my collection because um, I don't get things for future grandkids or anything. Don't worry about it. It's not a problem. Uh, upcoming events that we have going on. We are all the way down here. Next week, we'll talk to Mike again. Um, that was so enlightening. I'm really excited to hear what he has to tell us next week. And then we talked about the meetup at Jenkins Arboretum. That'll be at 930 on that Friday, the 21st. Earth Day is the next day. Justin and Denise are going to do the table. And if you want to join them there, the more the merrier. Um, just email me because I need to send you a, a volunteer form that they want to have um, just so they know the people who are on the premises, I guess. Um, the Lancaster Wildflower Festival, we just talked about that. And then our plant swap happened. So lots of big stuff in May, or I should say in spring. And then our meeting for May 11th will be Ben Kessler, Native Edibles and Companion Plants. 
we're doing a preserve tour at Donna Delaney's backyard nature preserve. Um, she has, I think, 10 acres that she is trying to convert to natives. Um, she's she's done a remarkable job of adding thousands of native plants there. We're taking July and August off, and then we'll be back um, in September and October. We'll do a seed swap in November, and we'll take December off for the holidays. So lots and lots of good stuff this coming year. I'm going to open the chat and see what we're missing. Um, Shannon is saying two tables at the Earth Day will have seed swaps and giving away native seeds. Um, awesome, such as Penstemon, uh, Solidago, Joe Pie, my favorite milk wheat. So you can save those seeds to practice your winter seed sowing um, come January. And oh, Bemerwaltz is open. Oh, good. Bemerwaltz is open. Okay. I have not been there yet. I have to put them on my list. Bemerwaltz has a lot of really great stuff. Um, I find the more I go there, the more straight species they carry, which is exciting. And remember, every time you go to all of your nurseries, whether it's our, our native plant nurseries or your big box store nurseries, ask them about native plants. Ask them where their straight species native plants are. Uh, I don't know about you guys. I'm super excited. Last week, I found straight species Phlox subulata at my Lowe's. And um, that was crazy. We couldn't find that last year for a project we wanted to do through the chapter um, at, at native plant nurseries. They were all sold out or they just weren't carrying it that year or they had had you know, a, a crop failure or whatever. But um, to find it at my Lowe's, I told everybody there as I was checking out, like, this is so great that you have this. I'm so excited. So the more we do it and the more we demand it, um, the more they will grow it. Make sure I'm not missing. Okay, I think that's everything. I think this is everything. Let me double check here. The nurseries that I like to list at the end. Yes, I think that's everything. So I'm gonna stop share. And uh, does anybody have anything else they would like to go over tonight? All right, well, with that, um, you're all dismissed. Uh, thanks so much for coming and enjoying uh, Mike's talk with us. Look forward to seeing you again next week here the second half of the, the drama unfold. Uh, if you have any questions about any of the events or anything you need from me, just email. I try and get back to you in a couple days or so. Thanks, Janet. Yep. Glad you can make it. Thank you very much. Wonderful meeting. Thank you. Guys, have a good night. Good night. It's good to see you, Shannon. I still have your books. I'll make I sure, know. <laughs> I'll make sure they're at Earth Day, if nothing else. I won't be there, but I'll I'll pack them along for Justin. Okay. Yeah, I'll be there. Um. Uh. Maybe I'll see you at like the Jenkins thing or something. And thanks great. for the link too about the um the wasp. Oh yeah. I that I looks interesting. I like bookmarked that and I, I love it. It's so yes. informative. Um I think that Susan is on, but Shannon, if you get a chance, if you would email Susan that link, maybe she could put that in the newsletter. That would be That'd really be a good great. idea. Okay. Yeah, I can do that. <laughs> I have to Sounds That's good. Awesome. All right, guys. See ya. Good night. Yeah, thanks. All right, Susan, you are on. Okay. So <laughs> hit George as a bonus because I'm not going to kick him out of the basement. <laughs> it's just fine. Our our yeah, yeah. meetings are open. We have open public, meetings. So right? I mean, he also has. I don't know if you can see. Cat on his lap. Not <laughs> through the glasses. There's Captain. One beer glass. Two. The burgers. Uh -huh.
Thursday night. <laughs> Julie, well, how, how's retirement? Oh, it's great. So far, I have, um, let's see, I've dumpster dived in two different ways. We, um, we rented a dumpster storage, had a bunch of drywall left in the garage. So he put that all in from the first floor, and I went up on the second floor of the barn, I mean, the barn, and threw it out. And then I went and I got this with this mesh deer fence stuff and it doesn't work and we hate it. So we threw that in the dumpster and then I put this big piece of drywall in the dumpster and turning to go out, um, did a face plant out of the dumpster onto the ground, hurt myself only a little bit. And then today, because we have this enormous area that we solarized with black plastic, we're getting 10 yards of mulch on Friday. So we took up the plastic, put that all the way, and we put down all the cards at the end. Oh, oh Jesus, she's got a birdie. Yeah, she Is it called retirement? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so we, we went, we literally dumpster dived. We went to the hardware and went in their dumpster. And then we went to behind this one big shopping center that has a big lots and a I don't even know all what else. Paint store. Jesse, what kind of bird is that? Um, they're my baby chicks for this year. Oh, okay. so yeah. it's, it's probably a speckled Sussex. Uh, it's hard to tell till their feathers all come in, but that's probably what she is. She's so cute. Anyway, mm -hmm. so that's, that's been retired so far. Um, you know, putting down cardboard, dumpster diving, falling out of the dumpster. Tomorrow we're going to split the bees. Nice. You're not allowed to break yourself the first week of retirement. <laughs> she tried very hard. <laughs> <laughs> then I came in, I took ibuprofen immediately. And I, we have these really long, um, cold things, yeah, nice packy nice. things. I wrapped that in my room. It's a lot better. It's fine. It'll be fine. Yeah, I don't want to break myself the first week of retirement. Right. Um, all right, Susan, are you able to unmute? Can you hear us okay? No. You can okay, you can hear us, you just can't. Um okay, so we wanted to get together for the board meeting too, because we've had our first application for our um grant program. That was going to be most of what we were going to discuss. I think, Susan, are you in the chat? Okay. Um, so we just had some things we wanted to talk about and it was easier to discuss versus type everything out. And um, I think that we were all in agreement that our biggest hesitancy is just the scope of the project and the um, manner in which the homeowner is thinking about prepping for the project. So Susan and I kind of texted back and forth that we think that we can at least approve the first portion of the project, the um, advising portion the, the, of the grant and I can go and talk with the homeowners and, um, you know, give them some ideas and advice and things. Mm -hmm. And if they are on board with either phasing in their prepping so that they're not clear cutting everything and just causing all of that soil disturbance, then we can move forward with the second part of the grant, which is the plants. Mm -hmm. But if they are resistant to that, if they're not really open to... Um, not creating this this crazy overrun area open to full sun with lots of weed seeds and invasives that are going to move in and overcome very quickly the 25 plants we want to give them then we'll leave the grant at just the advice portion how does everybody feel about that i'm sorry if she was if she was going to get you know, goats to come in and just eat everything down to the ground, then I would think that it would be better because I don't think goats tear up stuff too much, but they will eat it down to the ground. But she's going to get this guy to come in with the backhoe and pull everything out. And she's going to just be solid and bases exactly as she is now. Right. Plus compacted soil. 
And and she was talking about cutting down some natives. I wonder if she knows which are which. Right. So I think that it's a good opportunity for some education on um, a person who already wants to be doing the right thing and they want to, she wants to do it in a big area. That's wonderful. I just don't think that she realizes how big that project actually is and how long it's really going to take. I think um, educating about not instant gratification is going to be part of it uh, and about the damage that we've all done. Hopefully she can learn from our mistakes where you think ripping everything out and starting from nothing is the way to go and how quickly that nothing fills with all the things you don't want. Um, so those are the two biggest parts of what we want to talk with her about. Susan, if there's anything that um, you're thinking that I'm forgetting, if you want to type it into the chat so that we can um, make sure we have your thoughts on it. Those were our biggest sticking points. Yeah. Could you uh, talk to somebody on your cell phone? I mean, yeah, we could. If Justin had just said, if you want, we could call you on the cell phone. That way you could talk. Okay. Do you want me to do that? Computer I'll call you. Can she call into the Zoom from her phone? Uh, Usually there's a phone number with it. That's another good, good idea. Did anybody get else get the um, the idea that she, like this was imminent? She was having somebody come in like any day and just. It did. It did seem that she wasn't going to waste a great deal of time, regardless of what was said here. Well, I was kind of um, hoping that she would have stuck on the meeting. Actually, I don't know if we should have invited her or not. Um, specifically, but she was in attendance at at our meeting so if she stayed I would have been fine with that and but I didn't necessarily I kind of want to talk to you guys first about it though so I didn't exactly invite her, um, her specifically um Jesse, what was her name again Janet Janet that was Janet for June. you know when I first started my meadow or whatever I I, I could have really benefited from someone advising me about the fact that you aren't going to have instant gratification and that the dealing with invasives the first year is critical and you know all that stuff that I kind of learned by by uh, trial and error rather than and and I did have professional people they just didn't seem to tell me those things right. well, we, we had nobody and in our previous house we literally personally the two of us dug up all the grass and planted native plants. And the next year, the invasives were insane. And we didn't do what needed to be done with them. And the young couple that bought the house from us pulled out all the everything that was there and replanted grass. They also have a, a three-year-old son or something. They wanted him to have a backyard he could play in. They didn't, I don't think they did the quarter round garden, which had a Black Cohosh and Golden Alexander. Yeah, and Papara. So the butterflies will be happy. Yeah, I think they left that corner and they, they left definitely left the blueberry bushes, which I would have loved to have taken, but so did have you, Jesse, have you spoken with, with her? Do you have a sense of what she uh is familiar with or knows or I haven't talked with her yet. Um, that's what tonight's meeting is the prelude to. So I think once it sounds like we're all in agreement to take on the to approve it um, conditionally with just the advice portion first and then the plants afterwards. Right. Um, but I have Susan on. I'm going to see if she can. Susan, if you talk. Can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Can you yes. Hear me? Yes. Okay. Good. I'm on. Thank you, Jesse. I couldn't call in somehow, but um, you when you called me, now I've got no speaker. Okay. Um. So shall I do an after? Here, we have accepted the first part of your application. Someone will be in touch with you. 
I can't understand you. Yeah, I think it's because it's it's echoing. Um, it's got the echo. Sorry, got the echo. Sorry. No, it's because it's going through my phone and then into the computer. Um, we need one of those young techies around. I know, right? <laughs> It's very frustrating. I'm sorry, Susan. No, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so I was asking, should I email her to let her know that we've accepted the application and someone will be in touch with her? I heard you say, do you want us to do that? Do you want us to reach out to her? Is that what you're saying? No, I said you want me to. Okay. Okay. I'm happy to do that if that's the board's decision. Okay, so what Susan's saying is she can reach out to the, I still hear echoing. She can reach out to Janet and say somebody will be with her. We've conditionally um, approved the first part of the application. I'll meet up with her, meet a time because I think I'm the closest. And uh, we'll go from there. And I'll let you guys know kind of the receptiveness if she's in agreement with phasing it in and we can then make a board decision on the plants. Right. That sounds good. Yeah, I mean, she wants to hear from someone who comes from Janet and George your experience of destroying um, What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, she's saying that I'll let her know, I'll let Janet know that we could all do a zoom together as the board and then share our individual experiences like Judy and George and your what you did you clear cut removed everything and the invasives that you um, encountered that way she has not just my my you know anecdotal evidence but several people's experience with it but we would like to be supportive that that, that we don't want to have her get so uh, overwhelmed. I mean, the reality bit I think is important, but I don't want to cut her off. I Google map stalked her and that neighborhood does have a lot of lawns, like acres of lawns. So it would be good if we could support her to not go back to a lawn. <laughs> is there a way she could do a partial thing? I mean, is, are there areas that to deal with first rather than the huge cut everything down idea? Yeah, that's going to be when I meet with her, th those will be things that I discuss. I will encourage her um, that I love that she wants to tackle this, that she uh, thinks <laughs> that she could take on all of that big area is promising. Um, it means that she's enthusiastic. She wants to make a big difference. Yeah. Um, that's great. She might I, change your whole neighborhood. Well, I would love that. Um, but I think that, you know, I'll feel out what experience she has and, right. and go from there. So she's talking what two tenths of an acre at the top of a hill that was mowed like 10 years ago. And then since then, it's just been allowed to go rogue, as it were. Yeah. And she said, I think there's a couple of native, what you say, sumac trees, I think. Yeah, that she wanted out. Right. That she wanted, I, mean, I got the sense she didn't realize they were native. I think she said she thinks, I think she did say something about them being, a, there were a couple of native trees. And I thought she knew, but didn't like them. That's what I got right. the impression of. Yeah. So I thought she said she needed to get the mower in in it, they were preventing from getting the mower in there or something yeah. yeah so that'll be right i agree that susan said that bothered her i uh, agree um i think it's going to be a feeling out process that's right. why right. the advice portion is in there and um hopefully we can move forward and give her plants i would love that but if it's just going to be that we're setting the plants up for failure then then it we will leave it at the advice portion and, and 25 plants in two tenths of an acre isn't going to make a significant difference anyway. It's, I mean, it's you're talking not. Plants, right? You're not giving her 25 trees. You're giving her 25 plugs. So it's, you know, it's just it's going to fill a couple of trade tables worth of space. Right. Yeah. Well, we can let her know about 
uh, Corey and the Keystone program and help her get some trees. Yep. Um, but it's good that we you're going, Jesse. Won't be able to do it this year, though. What's that, Marilyn? We're, we're, she won't be able to do that this season, though, because yeah, I mean that that's being delivered in in April. Right. Mm -hmm. But those but resources are order. good to know about, and that it right. will be a great um reminder that there is no instant gratification like there are these great programs right. out there but they're cyclical you have to wait for them and it may take you one two three four years before you're getting the plants that you know you want on your list or you have but that gives you time to think about it time to plan more accordingly time to get used to what you have as you phase it in how to take care of it how to propagate it we all know if you get some really nice aggressive plants in there you can fill a lot of space for free because they volunteer to fill up that space versus trying to select a couple of you know plants that you almost have to baby and cage and protect and do all sorts of stuff with um so making some wise choices about the plants that she either keeps like the sumac that would cover lots of space for her if she wanted to or um and they suck her exactly yeah that's and they're on hillside they like hillsides yep they'll control her erosion they'll yep and they make a great that that understory canopy, they're wonderful for that. Well, color. Yeah, she should go back and read my, um, what Susan wrote up about my uh, diary of a rewilder. The, I think, was I the first one on that? <laughs> That's Susan? a good idea. I took on everything at once and that was not smart. <laughs> <laughs> What's the extent of the financial, how much is she actually asking for in terms of the grant? Oh, hi, Rick. So the oh, sorry. sorry for joining like after the fact. In. <laughs> Her specific grant is the um, homeowners rewilding grant. And that one only comes with the 25 plus. So okay. it's it's specific to that amount of plants. Yeah. So it's not a lot of money. It's, it's some portion of Jesse has volunteered her time to go look at what it is that she's working with right. and, and take some pictures because I mean, I, she didn't supply any pictures and they would have been able to see what, you know, is actually there. And I know you're good about taking pictures and sharing them so right. nice to see what's actually there. Yeah. Um, because the perception could be off too, you know, I mean, how she's looking at it, you know, as the homeowner versus how we may see it could be different so right. it may not be as quote unquote bad as as we might think and that's why it's going to be a conversation um you know we got to feel it out but susan has said um i'm sorry i she tells me in my ear and i'm trying to relay it um the advice portion no that's okay the advice portion is like going to be the most beneficial for right. her and we also all know we meet people at different parts of their path so it may or may not be the right time for her to hear our advice and take it for what it is and kind of learn from our mistakes and, and recommendations and things. Um, but maybe we'll luck out and it will be, and she'll take it and, and run with it. I do think that she, in an email to me at some point, had said she was catching up on old meetings and things. So by the time I end up getting on her property and we do an eval and stuff, maybe she will have heard a bunch of these things. So I will be that seven the time she's hearing it instead of the first and uh, be able to you know, have the right impact. Right. This sounds like the way to go. Okay. I mean, so 25 plants, we're talking about an investment of what, a hundred bucks? Essentially, it's like $90, I think, right. pollination. Oh my gosh. Um, I couldn't get broken. <laughs> yeah. I I don't think it's a matter of approval, right? Like, I think we're all okay with like giving her a hundred dollars, giving her 25 plants. I think it's well, more the point that Richard did if she takes this two tenths of an acre and she has this guy come in with a bulldozer and he takes out everything. All the ground's going to be torn up. She plants these 25 plugs. And if she doesn't do something with the rest of the place, it's going to be a honeysuckle field. Yep. Exactly. Or poison ivy or something. Right. We'll just go woohoo and move in there. It is a hillside, so it can erode. Right. That too. There, then she, it will be harder for her to maintain those 25 plugs if it has to be treated differently mm -hmm. than the rest of the two tenths of an acre. Can we convince her to downsize her plans, like to take that 
you know, a tenth of an acre and put those 25 plants within a confined yep. area so that it actually makes an impact? Yeah, like that'll that. be my goal to pick a right. spot, the, the most likely spot that is going to uh, be protected in some way in a condensed fashion to do. Um, to start off do almost like a, a mini garden within this whole area and expand out from there. Um, yeah. That'll be, you know, the, it'll be the easiest to maintain. It'll be the easiest to show her some success and progress um, instead of, you know, taking one plug and putting it here and 20 feet away and other plugs, right. more, you know, like. Um, yeah, so you ought to show her some of your photos of your yard, the, the uh, things that you've done every year, you add a different, um, garden or, or yeah. an area you ought to show her some of that and for her to get some ideas of what you've been and how many years you've been doing it right hopefully yeah hopefully she's open to it i'm i'm excited yeah. for the opportunity to hopefully encourage her you know we want her on this we want her to do this but in for the long haul not just be disappointed that 25 plants doesn't fill her you know two tenths of an acre and go from there right and realize that the work doesn't end when she puts those 25 plants in the ground right like mm -hmm. that there's a significant amount of you know we're all out there pulling garlic mustard and honeysuckle <laughs> and vinca every day right i think she thinks that she can just pop in a bunch of new trees and shrubs and it'll instantly be perfectly confined i don't think that she has any concept of how long Right. S Susan said sh she gets the feeling that the um, homeowner thinks she's going to pop in some new plants and a few and new trees and instantly have a native plant garden um, that she doesn't really understand the scope and the time frame that these things take to mature and fill in. Even if you get big trees that you're spending lots of money on, it's not a community <coughs> For years, like you, it it just takes time. So that'll be part of that learning process. Have any of you guys come across a good uh, placeholder crop or nurse crop? You know that can be like a um, a cover for the ground and keep the natives, I mean the uh, invasives, out a little bit. But then you can kind of work in better natives. I can tell you what's been suggested to me. Um, buckwheat was one thing. It's it's an annual and it, it dies with a frost. Uh -huh. Another thing is phacelia, but the only phacelia you can get is really from the West. What but about like the red creeping thyme, right? Can't you use no, that? no, it's uh, it's that blue um, P H Y C E L I A, I think. P-H-A-E, I think, P-H-A. And, and there is an Eastern and a Western and the, the only seed source I could find was Western. There um, is one that's native to this area, but- um, Oh, I know, but I don't think it's as good as a, for a cover crop or a, um, a, a matrix kind of thing that right. goes away. They use it at Mount Cuba Center. Oh, they do? They do. The yeah. Facilia? Where do they get the seed? Um, it per self perpetuates as an annual there, but because they have such a heavy seed load in the soil there, they come up every year. And they I've, I've planted the native, and I had it didn't come back. The, but then I don't do well with seed. <laughs> she'd probably I actually, be better off. I mean, if she's going to clear cut everything to just go like spend a hundred bucks at Ernst and have them like mix up a, wild, a native wildflower mix um, with partridge pea and Virginia wildflower. Partridge pea is a good rye. idea. Mountain right? mix like, is a good idea. Right, and have a seed mix drawn up that's all native and see what takes. Right, and Ernst is really helpful. Yeah, uh, Ernst is great. Does that. great. They, have, they have mixes that are already for that as cover crop. Right. Uh, but they'll also advise you too. They're just really good. Just yeah. Right. Yeah, I agree, Susan. Susan's Susan's point is, if your site isn't prepped, your weeds are going to come right through right. anyways. And Ernst recommends um, an herbicide to you know, essentially chemically clear cut everything. So um, I, I just think that we're going to need to narrow down the scope of her project is, you know, the first priority. And then, I agree. Um, you know, explaining the time frame 
and, and how rewarding that time frame really is. Like when you first set out, you think this is going to take forever, but the little incremental changes that you see each season are very exciting. You don't have to do a huge area for that to be exciting. I agree with that. Yeah. I think. <laughs> Thank goodness, right? <laughs> Oh my God, I'm looking forward to doing something smaller. The first garden we put in here was eight foot by about 120. And oh then the, the one that we're in the process of cardboarding to get mulch, which will eventually have some small gardens in it, is like 30 by 30. I want to do something small. <laughs> A little pocket garden, right? Um, okay, well, I'm glad we are all in agreement. Susan, if you want to and email her you know that and then she and I can just figure out um a time that I can get over there and and meet um I Karen speaking to your mountain mint thing I use mountain mint to protect a lot of things to cover ground until I have something else I want to put up there I find that it pulls up very fairly easily I can tame it when I want to I can move it around if I need to keeps the deer um, at bay keeps it keeps the deer the rabbits everything plus I mean covered in insect life while you leave it there uh, agastache doesn't like it here i don't really keep it around much um but i also put it with the mountain mint so maybe the mountain mint said hey you need to go somewhere else and it didn't, it didn't go anywhere but um yeah so i think seen... that's another good option for her that'll be on the cheap because mountain mint seeds will germinate so yep. easy. So you can do that, you know, cheap and cover a lot of area. Oh, too. I can give her some. Yeah. You know, I'll bring, <laughs> I'll bring a bucket full <laughs> at, on yeah. demand. Perfect. Um, okay. I think we're good on this topic. Anything else, Susan, anything else we wanted to cover at this meeting? I think this was specific to this. <laughs> Um, Susan reminds us about the bylaws. We need to pass them or recommend amendments. Tonight? Uh, not, not tonight, but um, look at them. I think they were in a previous email because they're from national and we just have to say we agree with them or we want to amend something. That's a good reminder. Okay. And you want to hear from us. Really, like, does it matter? <laughs> I'm sorry. Susan says the whole membership has to vote on them, not just us. So, but okay. we should at least at a meeting. Um, we okay. we should be aware of them. Good point. Uh, Susan says Judy had a good suggestion. Um, so Susan's going to send an email, kind of filling us all in, and we'll figure it out. Does everybody get Susan's emails? I know I don't sometimes. They show up in my spam folder. And if um, somebody replies all, I'll see their reply. And then I know to look for Susan's. That was a new thing that happened just a couple months ago. Prior to that, I wasn't having any trouble. I would always get her emails. Are you um, using Gmail, Jess? Gmail, yeah. Yeah, I, they went to my spam folder as well in Gmail. And, and I have I have Gmail as well, and it, it warns me that it thinks it's spam and gives me the ability to report it as spam or something else, but not to say no, it isn't spam. Exactly, I'm really right. frustrated by yeah, that. I don't know how to get it out of spam folder. Yeah, I'll just drag it into your oh. inbox. Yeah, okay. in your spam folder, um, you can move it out. I cannot. It, I can move it to my inbox, but I can't say this is safe. Accept it from this sender or anything like that. Right, me either. There must be something in, in Gmail settings, <coughs> anything that has Wild Ones SIPA in it is acceptable, but I haven't figured it out yet. I think well, that the root cause of this is just that little typo that's in her email. Um, it's not in the actual email address, but in her username as that email, like the owner of the email address, um, it's got like an extra I or an extra L or L, something yeah. in it. And I think that that's what flags it as spam and, and makes it difficult. But again, up until a couple months ago, was not never an had issue. a problem with it. Well, hmm. last week I got one email from her and the same day one went to spam. Yeah. But <laughs> I don't know what. I don't know. Yeah. So I just try and remember to look for it, but it also helps if we reply all when she's when somebody sees it. That way we all know to kind of look for it. But Susan, the other thing maybe you could do is I know it's more work for you, but if you put our 
personal emails, not just our, well, I guess it wouldn't matter if we have a personal Gmail. I get it at my personal Gmail account. Mm. I don't get it at the membership Wildlands account. I get it at my jbaylog at Gmail, which is where I want it. Right, right. You have mine. You have um, jdshiffler79 at gmail.com because I've gotten stuff from you there also. Um, not not always. And it's usually a response to something that I've sent. But yeah. Um, we'll figure it out. And um, my tacky uh, grandson is going to be here for Easter. I can ask him if he has any. <laughs> Actually, that's a great idea. Yeah. Just ask him, how do you get stuff out of spam? Like, how do you, how do you say Consistently a sender is safe? This is not spam. This is not spam, right? It's, it's you would specifically think, a Gmail I issue. I can do that. Like I can everybody do that that's going to spam folder uses Gmail, right? right. Okay. Yep. Just How skip Gmail. Go to Proton Mail. <laughs> it's more secure. Yeah. <laughs> you can go into Gmail and select things in the spam folder and say it's not spam. Right, Susan. From what? What way. email service? Oh, I use uh, Thunderbird. So from Thunderbird, you can whitelist or blacklist things. Um, I thought previously you could say, you know, accept mail from the sender through Gmail, but apparently not. I know how to do it in Outlook. I just don't know how to do it in Gmail, and I don't work <laughs> Gmail enough. Right. One of us will figure it out, or Marilyn's techie grandson will. I'm going to talk to my grandson. <laughs> He'll figure it out. I'm all in. We have a Zoom call with Marilyn's grandson. <laughs> all right. So um, is anybody else... Thinking of joining Susan and I at Jenkins. Uh, yeah, what, what that's it? the 15th? That's the 21st, I think. I'm getting, let me see, look at my map, my calendar. The 21st of, of, of April. Yep. <clears throat> the only reason I'm, I might be in DC, but I'm if I'm not in going to DC, I will do that. I like Jenkins. That'll be great. I've never been there, I'm excited. 9.30. I've never been there either, Monday I might be April. interested. And then um, Earth Day is the next day. If anybody wants to join Justin and Denise there, um, Denise, don't worry. Justin will have all the stuff. Um, and then the, on the 29th, who's going to the Lancaster Wildflower Festival? That sounds interesting for George, the tour. George and I are thinking about going. Um, it, it, it's been really great. The last two years I've gone. Um, my girls go with me and it's just a fun time. They usually have one or two food trucks. They have like um, service animals. They have wildlife um, rehab places. They have at least six or seven different native plant net vendors. Um, the Keystone Wildflower comes, some other vendors come. Um, they have speakers at different times. They do a couple different like guided walks around the property i think they're at a different property this year though i'm not sure but yeah and then the tour afterwards with um mark. Mark. mark yeah that was so exciting when he emailed i thought that was a great opportunity i think it sounds pretty interesting i'll yeah, see if too. i can make it yeah and it's the theme the double feature this month we're doing two meetings two um you know, a couple different meetups and then two things that day get to see each other right wow <laughs> in-person events that's crazy it is crazy oh, what's that really like crazy. i won't know how to act i you can't let me out in public really i mean <laughs> oh, yes <laughs> that was before the pandemic we couldn't let you out public, right. so. you can let jesse out in public you just never know how she's gonna dress <laughs> right <Yeah>. well <laughs> outrageous is usually the answer but Okay, guys, I'm, um, once again, I'm, I'm heading out. She is the sound of reason. All right, guys, yeah. thank you so much. Mother, I'm glad I got here at nine <laughs> and I'm leaving at 9.15. No, so so thank you. That works. Was the meeting, <laughs> meeting go well? Smooth? It was amazing. You Richard. missed you. everything, really Richard. Richard. It was the best. <laughs> and thank right. you, Jesse, for, for dealing with our, with our um, grant. Oh, I no think problem. it would be great. I, I hope so. But I just, if we can get more native plants in there, that, you know, that's what right. I'm See, that's right. why you're the one to talk to her. You're really that's good. That's the goal, right? Like, I think it's right. just. Okay, guys. She's See in you over her head. We all know that. Do. We've all Bye. been there. So. Right. Bye, Bye Marilyn.
Bye, yep, Marilyn. we'll try and do the best we can. Um, Bye. Good night. Just be the voice of reason. Uh, maybe. Sometimes. It'll be me trying to make a project smaller. That's kind of unusual, but it's what needs to happen for this. Listen, I've got 25 plants in my milk jugs that I'd be willing to donate for the cause. Oh my um, gosh, look at that. She needs you know. to come to the swap. If she's serious about doing this yeah. project and getting all these plants, she needs to come and take advantage of when plants are available for sure. She needs to come pull garlic mustard with me for one afternoon and see what's involved. <laughs> in return, <laughs> That's yes, trade. that's perfect. <laughs> Hopefully she can make it to uh, Mark's project too and see you know what he's been doing. Yeah. He said he's been there 30 years, so... So. that'll be good all right we'll all right i got an email from weeks. susan just now Woo! she's quick can't keep that girl down she can't talk <laughs> on the zoom but she can get stuff done she certainly can thank uh, you ladies enjoy the rest of your week and we'll too. see you bye guys week, right next week yep yep all right. take care see you then.